Professor of Social Communication of uh, the, uh, the Methodist University of Sao Paulo, who is the author of the report, uh, Fundamentalism, the Crisis of Democracy and the Threat to Human Rights in South America. And as I said, uh, this was commissioned by the ACT uh, Alliance Ecumenical Forum, FESUR. Uh, we also have with us Santiago Espitia Fajardo, who is a te theologian pastor of the Brethren Christ Church of Colombia, director of the Mennonite Biblical Seminary of Colombia, teacher of the Pontifical Javeriana University PhD student, at the Protestant Theolo Theo Theological University of Groningen in Holland, and he also holds a master in bioethics. And we also welcome Vladimir uh, Stenenagel. I'm sorry for the bad pronunciation, you will correct me later, Vladimir, Vladir, uh, who is a Brazilian Lutheran minister with, with a PhD from the Lutheran School of Theology, Chicago. And he has, a, he has strong links with the Lausanne movement and the Evangelical Alliance of uh, Brazil. So I invite uh, Magali to start her presentation, please. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. Thank you all. Greetings from Brazil, from Rio de Janeiro. I see a picture of Rio uh, in Eva's background, Eva Skog. Thank you, Eva, for bringing Rio to this uh, picture. And it's a joy uh, to share with you these uh, important um, reflections that this, uh, as Eva explained, uh, the process of this uh, research, uh, that is not something to be taken as a final conclusion, but it's, it was built to do what we are doing now, uh, to reflect and build more reflections on that. I will be sharing uh, some slides uh, to help you uh, to follow me and to, to help to keep me on track also uh, on the time. So uh, before I present highlights of this report, I would like to make some preliminary remarks on what Petra has already mentioned, uh, the place, the role of religion in Latin American history and culture. Religion is a very important element in history in Latin American culture. And we have an image inherited from the process of colonization of the continent that Latin America is a Roman Catholic continent. What you are going to reflect today is that it's not true. It's a, a, a mistaken, a wrong idea. Uh, or it was in the past, yes, we could say that, but along this more than 500 centuries of history of, of, of Latin America, we have religious plurality, a plurality of faiths that sometimes is hidden in the way uh, we have news on Latin America spread, on the way political uh, images are built about the continent, because we have religious plurality and religious plurality or plurality of faiths as strong expressions of life in the continent. So this plurality is also present among Protestant Christians. Because we are going to talk today many things about Protestant Christians. And it's good to think that plurality is also present among this segment of Christians. They are popular called evangelicals. It's not the same idea of evangelicals in the English language. In, in, in Spanish and Portuguese, we call evangel evangelicals or evangelicals translating, but it's not the same idea. Evangelicals in Latin America is the same as non-Roman Catholic or non-Orthodox Christians that are present in the continent since the 19th century. And we have historical Protestants or historical evangelicals who came through immigration, through mission work, 
we have Pentecostals and, be, be, and in Pentecostal groups, they are diverse too, because we have classic Pentecostals like Assembly of God, Congregational Christians, Pentecostals, and a series of groups. And we have the, the recently called Neo-Pentecostals that are uh, very new expressions that if we have time, we can talk more about that later. And we have revival groups that are present in different traditions. We have independent communities. And so it's just a mention of how historical and how Protestants are so diverse. And we have also different theologies, different discourse on faith, on Christian faith. We have on the phase one with the missionaries since the 19th century, evangelicalism brought with mission through fundamentalism at the very beginning, through pietism. And we have the social gospel also. We have in phase two after 50s, Protestant liberation theology with dimensions of ecumenical theology, biblical theology, feminist theology, and public theology more recently. We have the theology of integral mission. We have prosperity theology. And we have the dominion theology that is present in our report on the research. And we have now in phase three, after the 2000s in the 21st century, Pentecostal theology built by Pentecostals that are very challenging uh, 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 reflections. Build a, a building of black theology, something building on black theology, or indigenous theology, and the theology of plurality. So these re remarks are only ideas that I bring to you for um, like uh, bringing a, 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 a background to what you are talking about that is very important for our reflection. And finally, in this preliminary remarks, the public presence of, of this Protestant churches in Latin America is very strong. We have to recognize that is a, a, a history of isolation of groups who think that church is separated from society and we still have groups on that. But we have a history of interventionism in society with act, actions on a substantial uh, uh, aspect, a substantial actions to, to overcome poverty, uh, to support in, in social causes. But we have strong social political actions too, institutional social political actions through politics and non-institutional expression, social agenda. Uh, ecumenical movement, evangelical movements, and, uh, and many other movements that express that. So, given that, uh, coming to our uh, report, it's important to highlight, I, I'm, I'm bringing some highlights to you, and uh, uh, bringing first the acknowledgement that in the 21st century, there is an advance of fundamentalism. As Eva told, uh, it was acknowledged in a first meeting in 2019 of the ACT Alliance in Latin America. And there is an acknowledgement of the new stage of fundamentalism from the United States. Fundamentalism was a movement born in the 1910s in the United States. And it was transformed during 20th, 20th century with a political dimension. Moral majority was a movement uh, created in the 70s that brought a political dimension to fundamentalism movement. And then fundamentalism becomes a social phenomenon that goes beyond the religious dimension. So when we talk about fundamentalism today, we are not only talking about religion. We are also talking about at least different movements in the, the public sphere that makes use of a political or of a religious matrix to make politics. And so it becomes a social phenomenon that goes beyond the religious dimension, acquires a more diversified profile and assumes a political, economic, environmental and cultural character. For example, what is being done with Amazon forest 
has a lot of fundamentalism on it. And not only religion, uh, an economic and a, a environmental idea of, 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 of a kind of fundamentalism. And that's all on, and on what Fessor Act Alliance Research is based. So I will show you now three findings of our research. Our first one uh, is fundamentalism as, as understood as a religious political phenomenon in Latin America. And we understand, as, as, as the uh, philosopher Junger Habermann says, that the 21st century brings to the world a political revitalization of religion. What he's also uh, 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 known as a post-secularization of the world. There is a constant presence of religion in public sphere, despite the process of social and cultural modernization that the uh, countries experienced. And I'm not only talking about Christians, I'm talking about Islamic groups, Buddhist groups, and any other religions around the world, and many other cultural and political contexts around the world. And specifically about Latin America, Latin America can be considered a fertile ground for the emergence of fundamentalisms, because it's a continent of religion, as I've already said, with a Roman Catholic Christianity that is hegemonic, plural Protestant force in the last three decades, and, and very important, however, important but demonized expressions of indig indigenous and Afro-descendant groups. And it's also a continent of colonialism and military dictatorships with a social political structure, land ownership, races, racism, authoritarianism, populism, patronage, and corruption. And we also have to recognize a wrong conception of fundamentalism, a kind of reduction. And media, media like journalism and other expressions of media, have strong responsibility on this reductionism of the conception of fundamentalism. The term is commonly used to classify authoritarian positions, intolerance, intransigence of fanaticism, rejecting dialogue, denying pluralism, reconstructing a moral world and then idealizing the past. Worldwide, also a synonym of Islam. And this is wrong. In Latin America, the, there is a label to accusation Protestants, especially Pentecostals or fundamentalists, took as homogeneous religious groups. And I've told you that there is a plurality that is not homogeneity of it. So our first finding of our research is that fundamentalisms are religious political phenomenon. And we, we built a, a definition of it, contributing for, with the research of a definition. So we, we discovered that fundamentalism can be understood in plural as a worldview an interpretation of reality with a religious matrix combined with political actions resulting from this religious matrix, which weaken democratic processes and human rights, especially those related to sexual and reproductive rights and those of the tradition communities, politics of valorization of the plurality. Fundamentalisms are not homogeneous, they are diversified, made up of different groups, religious or non-religious, that have common enemies to fight with different actions in public space. This is why the structural character of fundamentalism is oppositionism. This is very important for our comprehension. And then the second finding, the funda fundamentalist trends in Latin American region. In our research, we found seven, seven fundamentalist trends. And I, and I highlight that it has not to do only with religion. 
the black the backlash on sexual and reproductive rights. This is one important aspect. Sexual and reproductive rights and movements that work on this taken as enemies of the society. Second, the pro-family discourse as an economical political project. Uh, the defense of the traditional family, it's not only a religious aspect, but it's an economic politi political project to take a state out of rights on health, education, on, on, on uh, uh, rights of all, uh, the elderly, that in this discourse, in this ideological discourse, brings to family the responsibility on all that and not the state. Third, moral panic and permanent clash with enemies. The spread of disinformation and fake news uh, financed with money brought to do that from different groups from the United States. Threat to traditional communities, indigenous, and Afro-descendant groups who was demonized and put on the track and as they own land, as they occupy land, that is the aim of many economic groups like mining groups, agro-business groups, and many other that we could name. For coordinated actions by different fundamentalist movements and groups, like the movement uh, uh, no temetas, or with my children, do not you don't put the hand. I don't know if the translation would be like that, but it are movements that are uh, working to have an influence on education policies and on the and juridical and judicial and the law process in the country. And they are very coordinated with very similar actions. Appropriate, appropriation of the issues of secular state and religious freedom. It's not, uh, uh, these are not issues of the progressive and ecumenical groups anymore. Secular state and religious freedom are agenda for the fundamentalist groups. And new fundamentalist List movements coming from the United States operating in South America with aim on youth, on culture, and on education. And finally, the third finding of the, the research that are the possible strategies for response. I have five minutes in my presentation, and I will show you briefly the 10 uh, the 10 possible strategies for response, and we can talk more later and, and make it more deep if we have time. First, necessary self-criticism of the ecumenical, of the open uh, churches, uh, open church groups to, to social political dimensions and of activists on, on, on human rights. A self-criticism that these groups have not taken uh, a religious properly, taken religion properly in their comprehension, the popular, the people's religious aspects properly in their actions. There is a need to strengthen institutional actions in regional alliances of all these groups in the same way as fundamentalist groups do. Second, adequately understand of the role of religion and its relationship with society. This is very important. Third, retake critical thinking formation. That was very important in the 80s. The critical thinking formation in Christian-based communities, in ecumenical groups in Latin America, and that is, is there in the past. We don't need to do the same, but we do, but you have to, to get inspiration on what was done in the 80s and remake it in the light of what is going on. Undress the conservative field and fundamentalisms. Understand this process. Pentecostal evangelicals are not the culprits. They are, have not to be blamed. They have to be understood. There has to be dialogue with these groups. 
not make them uh, uh, culprits of this reality. Fifth, understand more deeply the complexity of social demands. There are groups in the streets now in Latin America, in Colombia, in Brazil, in Argentina, in Chile, in Bolivia, demanding social justice. What are these groups saying to society? It has to be understood. Consider emotions and new languages in the organization of social life. Uh, progressive and, and, and human rights groups are understood as very rational groups. There has to be understood that emotions are part of Latin American history and culture, and fundamentalist groups do it very well, and we have to learn with that. Reveal the discourse of the defense of secular state as opposition to fundamentalism, as these fundamentalist groups use the discourse. Attention to youth, youth has to be a priority in all actions. Learn with indigenous and Afro-descendant communities. They have a lot to teach. And reformulate communication processes, the, the, the use of the internet, of social media, of communication, because the pandemic is teaching us a lot to use that. And we have to learn with this reality and make use as fundamentalist groups use to spread fake news, to spread disinformation. We have to humanize, humanize, humanize social media. And with that, I finish. I have my 20 minutes. Thank you very much. And I will be open to questions, to dialogue on the, 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 the time that we have ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Magali. We will now proceed with a, a presentation by Santiago Spitia Fajardo, uh, entitled The An Evangelical Perspective, The Role of Evangelical Churches in Peace Building. Over to you, Santiago. Thank you, Eva. Uh, thank you, Magali, for your presentation. Uh, greetings or good morning from Bogota, Colombia. Uh, thank you for the invitation to participate in this space. I, I think that is important for, for us talking about this, this, this topic. So I will share my, my screen. It's okay. Okay. <clears throat> My presentation will be brief. So uh, I hope to communicate the main ideas well. <clears throat> so uh, to begin with, I want to express that I agree to a large extent with what was uh, present in the report on fundamentalism and politics in Latin America. Um, is, is, I, I think that this is a <clears throat> complex subject. So have many faces. And I think that it's important to to see different points of view about the, this, this topic. So um, in, uh, in my presentation, uh, I want to address the issue by referring to the work carried out in Colombia by Justa Paz. Uh, Justa Paz uh, is the Mennonite Christian Association for Justice, Peace, and Nonviolent Action. So, and the reason is because this organization has been working mostly with Pentecostal and evangelical communities 
for more than 30 years. And many uh, of them with a fundamentalist background. So our work with these communities is important to talking about uh, the, the, the real uh, uh, questions, problems uh, of, of these communities. So um, Custa Paz was created in 1990 as an expression of the Mennonite Christian Church of Colombia. Uh, with the, with the necessity to respond the violence uh, in different ways in our country. So Justa Paz work, uh, especially in processes of peace building in different parts of uh, Colombia. But uh, as I say, uh, the, the churches uh, that we work are evangelical or Pentecostal. So uh, we are Mennonites, but we work with other communities. Mm. Justa Paz uh, belongs to the Mennonite Church of Colombia. Uh, and we work in different areas. So I just in, in this in this presentation I will mention five contributions that from Justa Paz we have learned to counteract the phenomenon of fundamentalism in Colombia. So I hope this contribute uh, in, in, in a some way to you. The first contribution um, I want to make to the subject is that the phenomenon that is categorized as fundamentalist should be analyzed not as if we already knew which churches belong to that group or in other words, not to define per excellence as evangelical or Pentecostal is synonymous with fundamentalist. So uh, it is important uh, to think in, in this. For example, in 2016, uh, when Colombia won the no in the plebiscite for the peace accords um, with the FARC. Uh, FARC is a guerrilla group. Alpha, it is true that many people from evangelical and Pentecostal churches vote against these accords with the no. But many of these communities, uh, but uh, many, many people of these communities uh, vote for yes. So most uh, now mostly people of, of these uh, voted for, for, for yes, are from rural and peasant sectors. So many of them are direct victims of the Arab conflict. So it's, it's important the, the place uh, and the life situation of the people uh, of these communities. Therefore, there are communities of faith that have a clear fundamentalist background, but in practice, they are not. In the case of Colombia, repeat, many of these communities are in a sense, in a sense of violence, 
and our conflict, they are vulnerable, peasant, or marginalized communities. These communities, uh, for many year, years, has been working for peace building. So uh, this is a, 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 a contribution, uh, I think that is uh, important to think about that. Secondly, um, I want to highlight the importance of training in Bible study processes, specifically with respect to the methodology of contextual, popular, and community reading of the Bible. Over the years, we have found this to be a very powerful tool for countering fundamentalist ideas and practices. These studies and readings from the Bible are carried out with an emphasis on his building. So in this sense, given that the Bible occupies a very important place in these churches, the Bible is the word of God. So uh, it is, uh, I think that it is essential to use it in educational and training terms. From my personal experience as a Bible and theology teacher, uh, approximately 19, 20 years, uh, I have noticed that many times people in fundamentalist churches have not had other learnings and have not learned other ways of reading or studying the Bible. So when, when we teach other ways to read the Bible, this is a powerful tool uh, to maybe to contribute to change points of view about uh, this, this, this topic. Another experience in the work carried out for, from Custa Paz with these communities is the exercise and practices of the citizenships that have zero in these churches. Since many of them are in a sense of our conflict and violence, processes of re reproachment and dialogue with the wider community have been developed, generating the understanding that they are not alone in those spaces. In this way, we think that the di dialogue is saw with the distinct, the distant, the diverse, and the willing for social agreement. For taking into account and starting from the real needs of the communities leads to generating local initiatives from themselves. In our experience, we have developed initiatives on peace, restitution of rights, reconciliation, among others. Here, learning resolves around praxis. An example, we have an example of the Sanctuaries of Peace Churches. This is a Justa Paz project that encourages churches to be constituted as a space in which, first of all, life is protected. This is how the Sanctuaries of Peace Churches assume themselves as defenders and protectors of life, serving as a refuge for leaders, social groups, young people, women, and anyone who is at risk. 
not only of losing their life, but of violating their fundamental rights. These sanctuaries of peace churches are protectors of life and defenders of human rights. Uh, and most uh, of the these churches uh, are or belong to uh, evangelical or Pentecostal background. Five, as Justa Paz, we have also witnessed collective exercises to influence public peace policies. For example, in the implementation of the peace agreement in citizen training in the territorial development plans. In many of these churches, they are training young people not to render to mandatory military service. Through training in conscientious objection from nonviolence and following Jesus. In summary, in the Colombian case and from Justa Paz experience of more than 30 years of war with both evangelical and Pentecostal communities, practices and theologies can be observed that question and confront, confront what could be called evangelical fundamentalism. I believe that it is necessary to take a closer look and these and other cases to generate learning about how to respond and address the challenges posed by the role of fundamentalism in a changing political scenario in Latin America. Th thank you. Thank you so much, Santiago. Uh, we're going to continue and we're actually four minutes ahead of time. So if you've given away four minutes, um, I gave the word uh, to Vladir and you have to say your, you pronounce your surname yourself, I think, uh, entitled An Evangelical Perspective from Brazil. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the privilege of uh, Eva, uh, for the privilege of being here. Uh, with you at this time. Um, it's quite rare that we are, uh, that we uh, still have uh, four minutes in advance. This is not so much our experience, uh, our experience around here, because time it's, uh, it comes to us in a different perspective. Thank you, Magali. Thank you, uh, Santiago. Uh, I, I have been listening and um, even spending some time at the report. And somehow I'm thinking, how, how are we communicating? How are you that are listening to us? Um, um, stomaching, listening to those uh, talks of us. Uh, uh, it's, it's quite a struggle because we are talking about the different worlds really in terms of uh, our experience here in Latin America. I have three remarks and uh, we can then further talk about those remarks. First, uh, Magali mentioned that, um, that the, the, the experience and the, uh, even the language of fundamentalism came uh, to, to us in Latin America, very much imported, imported uh, from the experience in the, in the US 1910, uh, in, in fact, 1910 was the fundamentals. And there were 10 fundamentals, so to say, that were uh, written down and that uh, became guiding principles for a church that was not part of the big church, that was not part of the big uh, European churches in the US, uh, but that uh, was more a kind of a grassroots movement uh, in, in contrast to the big uh, churches and the big institutions 
big, a big communication uh, enterprises. And those uh, communities, uh, independent churches, they, they understood themselves as, uh, as fundamentalists because they had the fundamentals. When we come to Latin America, and when we come to the, to the, especially after the 60s, a strong mission movement in Latin America, uh, that those uh, missionaries, they came by thousands to Latin America. And they came to Brazil, they came to Colombia, they came to Peru, I, can, I mean, they came, uh, China had closed the, uh, the, the frontiers. Uh, the missionaries were leaving China. <laughs> uh, and uh, at the same time, many young people uh, were uh, getting to the mission field and they come, uh, so they came to Latin America. Latin America was close. So you had that arriving of thousands of missionaries, exciting uh, young uh, guys, <laughs> mostly, uh, uh, saying we came here to preach the gospel. So the, 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 those fundamentalists, when they arrived in Latin America, it was with a positive affirmation. It was even has a, a liberal kind of approach because you came to a, a very a Vatican, pre-Vatican II Catholicism, uh, a very traditional, uh, power-oriented Catholicism. And within that environment, those uh, missionaries, so to say, came and started uh, planting churches. Uh, and, uh, uh, and most of those churches were poor churches. Uh, not necessarily in the big capitals, not the cathedrals. The cath cathedrals were there at the center of the towns. They were Catholic. And because the Protestant churches, they were mostly minorities as my own, the Lutherans. But when, so this is, it, maybe it's not that easy for, for us to understand, but uh, when we talk about the 60s, the 70s, and then the 80s, a strong movement uh, of those kind of uh, uh, independent churches, uh, that later charismatic churches, grassroots churches, uh, they, they grew, they grew and they became a phenomenon. Uh, you will remember some of the book that came out in the eighties, is Latin American, is Latin America turning Protestant. So, what we experience in Latin America in, in many different countries is a huge church growth that started at the grassroots that involved many poor people that uh, was an opening in into a very aristocratic uh, power structure in which we found also the Catholic the Catholic Church. So somehow this was a liberating movement uh from the grass perspective of the grassroots of the grassroots perspective when in, in more recent decades you find out that once you become uh, uh once you become strong once you become numerous once you become a big church there is another game that starts and i think what we face today uh, in the last decades, and uh, at this time, is that that new game where you have a big, so to say, a growing evangelical churches with all what it means. And, and Magali talked a little bit about the diversity, uh, looking into a new place in society, uh, looking to le leave behind the experience of being minority and now being a majority. And with, a, with, with that environment, you find new partners in conversation. Which are those new partners? And those new partners are uh, those uh, uh, forces 
that somehow uh, want to become, want to have a place uh, in society too. Uh, the second point that I wanted just quickly to stress is that we are, we have in, in Latin America, a fragile democracy. You don't have a law, a, a democracy that has a long history. We had slavery, we have colonial powers, we have racism, we have patri patriarchal structures, we have militarism. We, we are a, a, a continent, so to say, in a, in a constant turmoil where you don't have stable democracies. And what I think the, the report Magali points to is that we face again the threat of that democracy in, uh, to that democracy in, uh, in our present time. And, and this explosion, so to what we call fundamentalism today, uh, you, could, uh, you could have other names for it, you can, uh, pat patriarchalism. <laughs> Uh, but it's just a, a power game. It's a control of power. It's a control of the people. It's a control of media. And what we face today, that those churches who, be, who at the beginning were a voice, so to say, of liberation at the grassroots, today are becoming uh, associated to the force, to the historic forces of racism, of, of big landowners of patriarchal structures that want to control our societies and our tender democracy is under threat again and that is the agony of this hour and some of us uh, that that are part of the evangelical community i am part of it some of us who are part of that journey uh, are, are in the midst of that struggle of that struggle of, of, of this uh, oppressive uh, fundamentalism that is part of our, so to say, history that embraces religion again, as it did in the past with the Catholic Church, today with evangelical churches. And how do you break that kind of uh, oppressive system? I think that is some of our struggle uh, of our struggles today and i think that is the 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 struggle of the report that we face too what and i finish what we should not forget is the the powerful impact of the gospel at the grassroots level there is a whole there is a whole um, world of churches in the poor environment let's not forget the typical evangelical is poor is at the periphery is young is woman in many cases is a black person in small churches and those uh, churches they experience the same sense of liberation of the past new new a new environment of life once they uh, they 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 meet uh, with the gospel so how do we nurture those grassroots experiences of liberation at the same time where we struggle uh, systems of fundamentalism that want to oppress those same uh, poor people again thank you Impressive timekeeping and interesting comments from our Latin American um, colleagues here today. Uh, as a representative of a evangelical, I have to stress that Lutheran church, it is a great um, challenge for me to, to now make a type of uh, summary of uh, the previous presentations. I would also like to say that we are going to have uh, breakout rooms at uh, 1510. And in those breakout rooms, you're going to have the 
questions uh, posed to you in, in those discussions. So uh, commenting on, uh, on Magali's report, um, it is interesting to, to stress for our Swedish and Nordic participants that what um, what differentiate, as Vladi was also saying, that uh, the understanding of the Latin American context is that the report highlights the, the non-separation, the political, economic and social and cultural role in the state, uh, the presence of religion within the state. We are living in, in secular states and there is a clear separation of individual religiosity and faith in, in the Nordic countries. Um, so politics is re religion is uh, politics and magali you highlighted the the attack the sort of attack on or the different views on uh, sexual and reproductive health rights vladi you use it was interesting that you highlighted fundamentalisms as patriarchism which is also one of the the issues that uh, the archbishop of sweden Antje jacqueline often highlights in this shrinking space it's not only happening in latin america it happens everywhere so and also the the view on family it's also interesting how that the, the, the composition of what is viewed as family and, and the rights of individuals, Afro-descendants, communities of uh, indigenous people, women and youth. So uh, that's also an interesting point of view. And also I want to, from Magali's uh, presentation, if you, if you could, when you break out in, in groups, also focus on the possibilities uh, and Santiago was saying the opportunities. Santiago was saying that we have to look at um, the evangelical and the Pentecostal movement with nuance, because in communities, and all of you have said this, um, they're different. There, there is pu uh, pluralism within these uh, movements of faith. So we can't, we can't. Um, uh, put everybody in the same box and we have to have that nuance with us when we go into our discussion. So uh, Magali, in your report, you, you, um, you highlight, which I find very, very interesting. It's the self criticisms of ourself, the introspection of, of history. And Vladi, you mentioned that, and Gustapas, you've also worked on that. Uh, how did we, the context of how, uh, what you call colonialism and also the, color, the, the mission uh, in previous years of, uh, of um, how was that done and how do we, how do we uh, describe ourselves and what we're doing. Uh, the role of religion, which I started with, um, the role in the state and even in the, in the judici judiciary, the separation of powers and, and uh, how pol how relig religion is used by uh, the powers and also not only the the formal powers but also the powers to be the the parallel structures that exist in in latin america um, and also the the rethinking of i'm now repeating the the the, re the rethinking of uh, uh, of the the, the Pentecostal uh, and traditional or fundamentalist movements, or even individuals within these uh, faith communities, highlighting the social demands of communities and groups and, and individuals, the emotional uh, faith, the personal aspect of, uh, of religion in society. Because we also have to, to say that the, even if it's described in your report, Magali, it's also, it's not a theological, it's, it's about the role of uh, church in the state, in society for justice of all, parting from the gospel, which Vladi was saying, the gospel, what would Jesus do? Uh, and also the defense of the secular state in all its aspects, the separation of powers, judiciary, politics, and democracy. 
So, and the, the role, I think it's very important to highlight the role of youth, which you have both mentioned, both in the meaningful participation, but also the needs of the rights of the, of the youth. Uh, and also the, the role of the learnings and the strength of the, the, the Afro and indigenous communities. And also this has to do with, you haven't really mentioned, but the, the, the stewardship of those communities for the creation and the, the, you, the when we be uh, I don't know how you say that in English. Um, so Santiago highlighted the Pentecostal and Evangelical uh, movements are not synonymous with fundamentalisms uh, at all. And also fundamentalisms in um, per se is heterogeneous. There are fundam fundamentalisms in all denominations and, and faith groups. Uh, and also, which the report also highlights, the um, importance of contextual reading and biblical, uh, parting from theology and the Bible and the gospel in discerning uh, the present political and the society today. What does the Bible mean? And the engagement with uh, communities and faith groups at local local levels, not only when it comes to contextual analysis, I would say, but also to translation of biblical texts, i.e. what is there in the origins of, uh, of the Bible and what has been lost in translation, I would say. And also with regards to citizenship, the study of the Bible and the, the role of citizenship. And, um, I find it very uh, an important word when you finalize your presentation, Santiago, the role of reconciliation and dialogue and rights. Because, and reconciliation is a very important word, I think, for faith groups and, and, and an important work. And uh, then the thank you, Vladir, for your for pointing out that that, that gradual movement of uh, the mission movement coming from the states and, and Europe, how how that has evolved from uh, challenging the the Catholic hegemony in Latin America, and then uh, as as a progressive force, and and some of that movement has turned into uh, a liaison or. Uh, a, com a um, merge into the same type of uh, repressive or patriarchal fundamentalist uh, views or action. Um, so, and also we have to remember as Europeans that democracy is young in Latin America uh, and also um, and also what we are seeing now, for example, very present and to our great dismay, the uh, challenge is that um, a just social movement uh, in Colombia is answered by militarism, which is, um, which is also a feature, not only in South America, but also in Central America. So the renewed threats on democracy, on uh, on the control of uh, the separation of powers, the role of media and the shrinking space. And, and it's also, I want to highlight, it's also, it, this is not, this is, there are, the, the harassment and per persecution is a life, matter of life and death for, for journalists, journalists, for women's group, for the feminist movement, for the LGBTI movement and the particular threats to uh, human rights defenders and uh, environmental rights defenders in this region. So uh, we are talking about regain the liberation and church in society as a progressive force for the rights of communities and people. And, um, but you, you uh, as I said before, Vladi, you, you finalize by saying, the impact of the gospel at the grassroots levels for the poor, for the youth, uh, for the faces that these people carry are often black and, uh, and women. Those who define themselves as women, but also LGBTI groups. 
So with that, uh, we have some uh, questions in the chat, Peter, and we have two minutes. Do we have questions in the, uh, in the chat? We have comments in the chat. Um, more uh, more uh, of gratitude, but I hand over to you, Peter, I think, to explain to us what we're going to do now. Yes. Thank you. Um, actually, we're we're going to have five minutes of a technical break because we've been sitting and I recommend that you run around the building you're in or, or get a glass of water. Uh, so exactly a quarter after three Swedish time, uh, we'll meet again. Uh, please come back. Um, and uh, I think sharing uh, in, in the breakout rooms is maybe the most important part, talking together and discussing is, um, is what we like. And, and you'll have the questions uh, in the chat as you enter the rooms. And, and uh, when we get back, you'll be sent out into the breakout rooms and then you have to accept that uh, entering the rooms as I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with by now. So, Exactly in five minutes, quarter after, uh, we'll meet again. Enjoy your break. Welcome back, are all the groups back? I guess so, we are 31 people in the room and I hope uh, you've had fruitful discussions. We now have until three minutes to four, uh, which I think is a funny <laughs> time slot. Uh, we will respect the end time. Uh, so I invite, I don't know how many, how many groups were we? I think we were seven groups. Okay. Wow. So we have seven uh, questions. So I will just invite you to be brief and pose your questions to any of the panelists. I'm, I'm now seeing Jacob uh, in my, as a first person. Um, Jacob, uh, Jakob, could you please um, invite your group to start? Jacob R. Calling, calling. I think that was our group. Uh, Adriana, could you could you uh, post a question? Unmute, please. Yes, thank you. <laughs> sure, I can do that. What well, our question has to do with dialogue. How we we know that in Colombia, for example, this experience of the um, probably and probable dialogues, dialogos improbables. And how does it work? If you can share a little bit about this in, in, in the sense that the recommendation of Magali of the report to find ways to self-criticism and also to, to dialogue, to get in dialogue with, with fundamentalism or churches that are fundamentalism. This is our question. Can I, can I add a question similar to that? Um, just to add um, from our group, I would we, we talked about the polarization and and that there work there's a lot of dialogue going on on the local area, but when you come to the top political level field, there is lack of dialogue. There's strong polarization. So, are there any positive signs or any examples of a of of, of a good dialogue at that top political level? Because it seems like that's where things get, get very difficult. So I'm, I'm going to invite all the groups to post their questions. For, so we have all the groups given a chance to, to, to ask questions. So I'm inviting Sana's group. Were you in different groups? Sana Svensson? Sorry, I actually didn't participate in my group. Okay. Any other group, please? Tempo, tempo. Yes, we can <clears throat> uh, speak. I think it's group number six, maybe. Um, and the uh, question was, 
whether the term, because there's certain, you also said that, and that, thank you, the three presenters for excellent presentations, but you also said that, well, the, the concept of fundamentalism can also be complicated. I, it could be seen as we, when we call this, this tendency fundamentalism, that we are saying that these are the fundaments of Christian faith. So is there a possibility maybe to use another term? Like we have in Swerford tried to use the word neoconservative, for example, instead. Uh, or, or are there advantage of maintaining this concept fundamentalism, even if it's, if it's um, for, for its actual meaning, it's, we find it complicated. So I invite the next group. Thank you, Christina. Yes, uh, we talked a bit about uh, the actually the debate or the reaction in Swedish Christian media uh, and also from some other places that the report uh, is, it can be read as, as making, uh, causing, causing a trend of guilt of association. If you're evangelical, if you're a Pentecostal, you're like this. Uh, and then we were talking about the fact that this conversation today proves this wrong. Of course, you know, it's been a very dialogue oriented conversation. And of course, that is what we were saying that, you know, not everyone who's evangelical is in one way or another, not everyone is fundamentalist in this or that way. But the question is, how do we reach to the margins? Or how do we reach to those who, who would actually stand for, for the kind of agenda that we do not want to see? Okay, next. I could say something. Uh, I think that my question is, how could evangelical church have an important role to the development of the grassroots and like enhance democracy instead of shrinking it? Do we have any, any examples of that? Because I think that, uh, like you said, Magali, the church, the evangelical church is very plur pluralistic. And we know that we have some good uh, examples of that. So I would like to discuss that. Okay. I think we have two more groups, if I'm not mistaken. Or do we not have any more questions? Maybe we can start with the ones we have because time is running out. So I, I invite any of the panelists to comment on these questions. Magali. Okay, briefly, um, about the other concepts of, uh, for this phenomena, instead of fundamentalism, like neoconservatism or others, it's mentioned in the, the report that other uh, scholars or other people in the media are making use of them. However, the, the, re the research showed that conservatism uh, is not the same as what we are seeing as this phenomenon. Uh, this phenomenon brings aspects of fight against enemies, lack of dialogue, disinformation, misinformation, fake news, a, a serious moral panic, things that are not part of the history of conservative groups uh, in, in the public sphere. So that's a way that fundamentalism has characteristics that fit very well to what we are doing. And we have to uh, stress the better use of this term. That's what the research has shown. Um, well, the issue about dialogue, uh, there are two questions. I think uh, Santiago could help uh, with uh, examples and also Valdir from, from Brazil, I would pass to them. And how, how do we reach the margins, the grassroots, uh, people, people who are there sitting in pews, searching for uh, a therapeutic experiences, even uh, going to churches. Sometimes uh, it is, uh, well, we have heard here, and Eva has stressed something that is in the report, that is the role of Bible reading. Some understandings of fundamentalism uh, have wrongly thought that fundamentalism is the literal reading of the Bible. It is not. It's the, it, it's the instrumentalization of selected 
passage of the Bible to justify political positions. It's different. If it was literal, there would be a very different perspective of, of, of many church groups and many religious groups in society. It's not literal. So if we take seriously the Bible and not only contextual reading, Eva talked about translation. This is very serious. The way translation gives ideological aspects that drive, drive people away from several biblical perspectives. So it's very important to take this passion from the Bible that is present in church groups, in grassroots groups, and work on that. And second, it has to do with communication, is to listen more than to speak. We like very much to speak to people, to show what we think about people, but we listen very little. And we have to listen and learn from what, and when people take a position against uh, a feminist rights, for example, why people take this position against? We have to listen and to learn from different perspectives and take these perspectives into our dialogue, into our learning and, and, and interaction with those people. And finally, about the question on the role of uh, uh, Protestant Pentecostal evangelical groups in democracy, we could bring several examples of, of groups who are acting in, in, in different fronts, like um, uh, overcoming poverty uh, or struggling against, uh, for example, the, 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 the um, family violence and family abuse on women, on children, are very different groups acting in these fronts. And in Brazil, I can bring the example of the uh, Evangelical Front for uh, uh, the state, uh, the, the, the rights on the state. So these people are connected uh, to, to bring uh, uh, agendas or, and to give, bring pressure on the National Congress and the Parliament on several topics related to justice, related to rights. So there are several, we, we could spend here the whole day uh, sharing and listening about different experiences. Uh, thank you for, for bringing that to the table. Thank you very much. Santiago, would you like to continue? Okay. Um, some, some words about the dialogue. I think that the dialogue is, is not easy because uh, it is confused with want to convince the other. So uh, dialogue, dialogue is not argumenta argumentation. And many people, uh, progressive, are very strong in, in argument, argumentation. <laughs> so, uh, dialogue is, it is mainly listening and try to understand and listen the, the other part. Uh, uh, and I think that it's necessary to generate spaces, for example, in the churches, uh, to listen different positions, to listen, just to listen the, the different ideas um, about politics, about uh, Bible, about ethics, about anyway. Uh, for example, here in, in Colombia, in the last presidential elections, um, we, uh, like a seminary, a biblical seminary, we create a space uh, to listen to advisors of the different candidates of the presidents. And that was a, a, a good space to listen uh, different uh, opinions, ideas. And, and, and we opened the seminary to all the churches, uh, historical churches, Protestant churches, 
evangelical, uh, etc. Um, for the peace accords in 2016, uh, pedagogy uh, spaces uh, to 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 learn uh, and to teach were generated. So I believe that the churches can be spaces for listening uh, different opinions. Uh, well, in any case, it's not easy. This, this practice is not easy. Uh, because we, we tend to start with the assumption that the other part is wrong or is the bad one. <laughs> so um, this is a, this is this is not a, a good step to to dialogue. Finally, I think that for experience, a student the Bible in community can help to generate spaces for dialogue. So uh, there is a historical practice of Mennonites and Anabaptist churches. Uh, one practice, the name is a community discernment. And we, we practice uh, the community lecture of the Bible, study Bible in community, and, and read the context, social and political context in community. So that is an, an space to discernment and to dialogue, to, to, to listen to the other. So uh, I repeat, it, it, is, it is not easy, but it is necessary to learn, to, to listen, to try to understand the other, not to convince. So. Thank you. Vladi, I would encourage you to also address the um, question from Niklas of the Swedish Mission Council on, yes, dialogue we've heard can be carried out at uh, a more local community level, but what about the macro level? Vladic. <laughs> no, sorry, the, the, sorry. The, mac the, macro, the macro level, you have to ask Magali. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, the macro level, the, the word I'm using, uh, uh, it's historical patience. Um, there, there, is, there is a need for uh, continuous resistance. I wrote down uh, Eva four words. Uh, first listening and Magali and Santiago and, and Santiago uh, talking about the Mennonite, Mennonite tradition. It, it, I think we need uh, that kind of environment, especially also with uh, associated with self-criticism. I, I need to recognize, for example, that I am part of a uh, elite theological educator, <laughs> educated colonialist <laughs> and so how do to, to 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 listen second i think to build up a, a sense of togetherness and uh, as magali said there is a lot of uh, grassroots uh, movements i think uh, personally speaking i am i mean when involved um, and we can mention micah challenge we can mention tear fund we can mention World Vision, uh, and we are doing things together uh, in order to resist. Uh, uh, the third word is resistance. At this time, I think what we need is to recover a sense of minority resistance. And uh, the fourth word is caring. Uh, so listening, uh, togetherness, resistance, and caring. I think with this pandemic, what we have, uh, erupting again is a huge um, scenario of hunger, of hunger, of unemployment, of suffering. So we need to build, uh, to build up networks of caring structures uh, and caring gestures uh, at the grassroots level. So that somehow my, my own take ever in terms of how do I try to face myself. 
Thank you so much. Magali, would you address the macro question, please? <laughs> Oh, yes, thank you, Fauci. Uh, I don't know if I thank you, uh, because it's a very, I, I have to say a very hard thing to you. There is no way of dialoguing with those who have a clear project of oppression. We can't dialogue with these people. Dialogue with Jair Bolsonaro and church leaders who support him with 460 dead people from COVID in Brazil. These people are responsible for this death. We can't dialogue with these people. We have to put energy in dialogue with people of goodwill. And there are several politicians and people who are in macro level. Uh, I, I, I don't say in the government because it's hard to fight someone in Brazilian government, for example, and in Colombian and in, in Bolivian and in other countries. We have, but there are politicians in parliament, for example, who are people of goodwill and uh, with clear goodwill and uh, religious or non-religious. And we have to approach these people and create a basis and, and also in social movements in our countries who are struggling to create a basis for democracy and for justice. Because we don't have to put energy with those. We have to take from power. We have to take these people from power. And sorry to say that, but I'm, I'm really I'm realistic here. We are resisting, as Valdi said, and we are approaching those people of goodwill who want to save our countries from the hands of those people who are working for for destruction, destruction and death. Thank you so much. And with Thank those you. words, unless we have some people in the chat for fi a final question, which I don't see, I'm now giving you as a present, Nicholas, uh, five minutes instead of three to close up this very interesting seminar. And I'm, uh, I'm thanking all our participants and uh, our uh, presenters from Actio to Sweden and on behalf of Christian Aid. Thank you. I, I see your hand, Anna Maria. Did you have a comment or was it an old hand? No, it's a comment. <laughs> about I, actually, I will lead you. I'll, I'll give you one of my minutes. So please. Okay, one minute. Yeah. No, I think I'm well acquainted with Brazil. I'm, I was born in Brazil and work with Brazil. And I know that, uh, and I agree with you that it's impossible to have a dialogue with Bolsonaro, but I'm very, very worried about the polarization. I think the polarization is, is so problematic as Jair Bolsonaro is. So I would like just to ask you, what do you think about that? Wow, then I, I give you one minute to answer that to yes. <laughs> Magali. Uh, we have to evangelize the public space in this way. And evangelize means to humanize these relationships and, and stress the idea of dialogue uh, to, to bring people together. Though, and I say again, people of goodwill. We have religious people. And we have non-religious people, but who are people of goodwill. So we have to bring these people to the table. And that's the improbable dialogos improbables de Colombia. We, we can learn from them in this aspect. So thank you so much, uh, Magali, for that comment, last comment. Uh, it seems like there is a lot of dialogue that needs to uh, continue, and I think this that's actually the, the very aim of this, this webinar, or this dialogue, uh, that we as the Knowledge Forum for Religion and Development has taken initiative to. Uh, so my role here is to, on part of the Knowledge Forum, to thank you all for this, uh, this afternoon and morning, for you, for those of you who are with us from, uh, from South America. Uh, first, a very warm and, and sincere thank you uh, to you, Magali, for, for sharing uh, this important but also thought-provoking uh, report that has really animated, uh, given us a lot of lot to think about and also lots of important insights and also a lot of strategies on how to, to resist uh, and work uh, constructively for democracy and human rights. So thank you.
for for taking the time with us. Uh, thank you also, Santiago and Valdir, for your uh, contextual examples and also sharing. So we are very grateful for your contributions. And thank you all to uh, to all of you who have participated. And I'm uh, and and for for Eva and Peter and those within the Knowledge Forum who has, has worked for this. And I, I send with you a few words. Uh, Valdi already sent some of them, but uh, listening and dialogue uh, is just like keywords that we need to continue to do. And we need to have uh, a nuance is an understanding are two other words, which calls for what we call religious literacy, understanding how faith, how values, how religion uh, interplay plays with with power and social change. We we need to understand that because it's complex, it's muddy, it's but it's we have to understand it better. And I think this set webinar has helped us. Um, so thank you for uh, everyone for 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 helping us with that, and we need to continue to do that. The last word is resistance. And I think we need to resist and cooperate and create spaces for this, both the dialogue, but also the, the action. So the Knowledge Forum uh, is willing to be a resource or a network for that. And thank you for being with us this afternoon. Uh, so thank you for all, to all of us. And uh, I think Petra will, and if there are resources that we could send out, I hope that we are able to use this, uh, the, the, your emails, the, so that we could share some resources afterwards. So, Peter, is that the that was the last word? Thank you. That was the last word, and thank you, everybody who has participated from near and far. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.